Tanzania brought far greater disappointments. It was beginning to seem that Julius Nyerere's version of socialism was not as democratic as his supporters had hoped. In 1965, three years after he was elected president, he amended the country's constitution to ban all political parties but his own. Nyerere was asked whether a one-party system included safeguards against the abuse of power. To some extent, there are, there, there are safeguards. But uh, I have sufficient power under the constitution to be a dictator. This is a dilemma of this movement. Sometimes you build the leader to the extent that at, at the end when you, have, you think you have become free, the fellow has become so powerful you don't know what to do with him. <laughs> Nirere was looking away from the West for a model of socialism more suited to a poor country like Tanzania. In 1965, he made his first visit to China. You see, in the year we went to China, Tanzania was in famine. And by that time, we were only 15 million people. We went to China with one billion, and everybody had their full stomach. <laughs> one billion, think of it. They were making their own rails, and they were engineers building their own houses, building their own roads, you see. And here we, we couldn't even make a bridge. <laughs> China began to take a special interest in Tanzania's development. It would eventually contribute more than $2 billion in economic aid, more than it gave to any other country. As the friendship between the two countries deepened, Nyerere's vision of socialism seemed to veer more and more toward the Chinese model. And life in Tanzania began to revolve increasingly around Nyerere's single party. After the one-party system was implemented, the country became more and more authoritarian. Party youth wing, for example, was established that would go around uh, sort of imitating the Red Guards in China. The major newspapers were a party paper. The broadcast media was entirely under uh, government control. Uh, the independent trade union movement was absorbed into the ruling party. All, virtually all independent associational life was either uh, suppressed or brought under the, uh, the control of the party. In 1967, the country began to overhaul its schools, casting off the old Western system. Students would now learn practical trade skills and socialist ideology. Practical education in science, physics, chemistry, and biology ceased. And they say, this is now triumph, but as for us, it was the end of everything. Christopher M. Tequila is the pastor of the Full Salvation Church in Dar es Salaam and the leader of a Tanzanian opposition party. He has been arrested more than two dozen times for his political activity. His problems with the government began while he was in secondary school. All the teachers were from the West and they taught us, they sanctity of human life and dignity and all these things. Then all of a sudden, we were told that those people who were, who were told to call as our brothers because they love democracy, human rights, now we should call them imperialists and all these things. I was confused. The Tanzanian people did not embrace all aspects of Nyerere's socialist experiment. As much as he urged them, they simply were not moving to the Ujamaa villages. In 1973, Nyerere lost patience. He ordered all Tanzanians to relocate to the planned villages within three years. There were problems from the start. 
during the execution of the program, there were, there were mistakes. Sometimes the, a village could be taken to a place with no access of water, you see. Sometimes the people who performed the task were too brutal at times it happened. We were taken by surprise when the trucks came to relocate us. We had to leave the cashew nuts in the orchard just when they were ready for harvest. Zaituni Abasi's village was relocated to Gezololi in 1974. Not everyone wanted to go. Some of them were happy to come here and are with us through to this day. But others tried to escape and run away. That's why that place over there is called the mango tree of the militia. It's because the militia had to be deployed at that mango tree to keep them under control and keep them from escaping. The villages were disastrous for food production. In 1970, Tanzania had produced enough surplus corn to export more than half a million tons a year. Just four years later, the country had to import nearly as much just to feed itself. Tanzania's government-owned industries were in no better shape. Typical was the massive Morogoro shoe factory, by the early 1980s, it operated at 4% of capacity. Conflict on Tanzania's border with Uganda and an international oil crisis struck a further blow to the economy. After the war, things got tough. There was a shortage of a lot of things. I remember personally walking to Kenya to come back with toothpaste, bathing soap, and things like that. There was also a shortage of food. There had been a famine. Mm. So things were bad. Things were bad. Julius Nereri had succeeded in creating a nation. But socialism had failed to make it prosper. For many in the West, mostly on the left side of the political spectrum, third world socialism seemed an antidote to Soviet-style communism. But nations that took this path, like Tanzania, did not leap forward. In contrast, those that embraced private ownership and foreign trade, like Taiwan, South Korea, Hong Kong, and Singapore, boomed. These so-called little tigers provided a vivid rebuttal to socialist rhetoric. Be sure to join us again for the concluding episode of Heaven on Earth the rise and fall of socialism. For Think Tank, I'm Ben Wattenberg.